During our program tonight, myths, superstitions, and misconceptions about bats will be discussed and replaced with factual learning about the ecological importance of bats. Our presenter, Melinda Alvarado, has been a wildlife rehabilitator, conservationist, and educator since 1989. She has served on the Pacific Wildlife Care Board of Directors for many years. Currently retired, she continues to lead their bat rehabilitation team as a volunteer. Since 1999, Melinda has given over 900 wildlife educational programs to schools, libraries, and adult programs, 800 of which have been specifically about bats. She incorporates her vast knowledge and experience with bats as well as new bat discoveries in her programs. It is now my pleasure to present Melinda Alvarado. Thank you. Thanks. It's really great to be here tonight. Can everybody hear me? You can all hear me, right? Okay. I'm going to start off with a um, PowerPoint presentation. I can remember how to do this now. Okay. So throughout history, bats have been demonized, misunderstood, and, and mistreated and persecuted as well. Myths, superstitions, and good old Holly weird have contributed to all this misinformation. Bats are so complex and intriguing, it's hard to know where to start, where to begin, and, and, and talk about them. So what I hope tonight is that you um, go away with, with a desire to research them a little bit more and see how incredibly awesome these little creatures are and how important they are. They're gentle and shy garden allies. So the question is, do bats serve a role in insect pest control? And you can be the judge of that. This is called an emergence. It's a YOLO causeway up in Sacramento. It's a YOLO bypass wildlife area and it's um, bat habitation, habitat habitat is being restored. You can go there during the summer and, and have, and um, they have programs there where you can go and watch the bats emerge. There are several different species that live under there and have nursery colonies. So when bats first go out at night, they consume about 75% of, um, of their needs the first couple hours that they're up and then they go and rest. And then just before dawn, they come back out again and feed again, and then go to their day roost where they sleep. Okay. Bats are in a family called Chiroptera, which just means hand wing. They, their um, wings are just huge oversized hands. They have every bone in their wrist, their, their elbow, their arms, their fingers that we do. They have two knuckles on each finger and, um, and a thumb, and they can bend their wing just like we bend our fingers. The skin between their fingers coming out, they can hear the insects coming and they're ready to go eat. So it's six o'clock at night and they're already flooding out of the cave. Out of the cave. 16 minutes later, all three major caves in the area are um, coming out. All of the bats are coming out. They look like tornadoes. They dart, they come out in little puffs. They look like smoke when they're, they're coming. Um, Ivy and I got to go watch the, the Bracken Cave emergence once, and I would encourage everyone to go see that. It's it's truly amazing. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, anyway, these the the insects you notice are getting a little redder because they're getting anxious at, because they can hear the bats coming, and they're saying, "Girls, if we don't get out of here, we're going to be lunch for somebody else." So they're trying to fly up into the air. They can go two miles up, but the bats can fly that high. And these bats can fly 60 miles an hour. And it's not unusual for them to forage over a 40 mile area. Not all bats will fly that fast, nor do they forage over a huge area like that. But Mexican free tails are, are one species that'll do that. And six minutes later, it's all over. The bats are surrounded and are consuming 
about 50 tons of, of insects every single night from spring until fall. In fact, Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that across the US, bats consume 1,500 dump truck loads of insects every single night from spring until fall. So you could see how truly important they are and how without them, we would be overrun by insects very, very quickly. These little circles, those are, just, those are the males, they're just starting to wake up. They don't have to eat as much as the females. So they don't have to get up and, and go eat as quickly as much as the females do. Inside the cave, there are pups everywhere, all over the walls. They're born without fur. They're, eye, they're blind, pretty much like our puppies and kittens. And bat moms are truly awesome. They will, she will find her pup in that mess of pups three, four, five, six times a day to nurse it. She can't, doesn't produce enough milk to nurse more than one. So she has to find her very own. They know each other by, she knows about where she's left them, um, her pup, but she, they know each other by sound and by smell. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Worldwide, we can count about 1,100 different species. Th that changes. New ones are discovered as some, some are lost or some are regrouped. In the US, we have 45 different kinds of bats. More than half are now endangered or in rapid decline. In California, there are 24, or 24 species or 25, depending on the biologist that you're talking to. And in, in San Luis County, we have 18 different kinds of bats. Most of them you'll never see because they're very shy and they don't live around us, but there are some that you will, that do come around people and like to live in our attics and barns and behind the shutters and different places that we've made habitat for them. So a bat's body, they look really big when they're flying, but they aren't at all. Bat's body is actually um, much smaller. The wings make them look two or three times bigger than they actually are. This is a Mexican tree tail bat. His wingspan is about a foot, but his body is only two and a half to three and a half inches. They can live 20 or 30 years, which is a really long time for such a small animal. Bats are small and very long lived. The bat on the left is a mastiff that lives out in the Carissa Plains. This bat has to drop from an altitude, well, not altitude, but, but from 17 feet. And um, in order to fly, he cannot take off from the ground. Most other bats can take off from the ground. It's a, it's a struggle for them, but they can actually get flight. This, the bat on the right is a Mexican free tail. And the quarters there, just to give you some kind of reference. This is a pallid bat. She's pregnant. She's about to give birth to twins. Pallids are one of the few bats that'll have more than one pup. She, a pregnant bat, must eat her entire body weight every night. If a 150 pound mother, pregnant woman, had to eat that much food, she would have to eat about um, 50 pounds of potatoes. And um, or I'm sorry, 50 pizzas, 150 pounds of potatoes. That's a lot of food. They have, their metabolism is, is really incredible. So most bats breed in the fall when they're in their peak physical condition. The female stores the sperm. And then in the spring, she'll ovulate and, and become pregnant. Now she can do something that's pretty amazing. If it appears that their insects are not going to be there to support both of them. She can slow her pregnancy down and she can also absorb the fetus if, if it looks like it's going to be a problem. I'm not going to say what I, a lot of times I, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> My daughter's laughing at me because she knows what I was going to say. <clears throat> um, so this is a newborn bout, newborn pallid. I got him when he, when he was first born, the mother died. And at that time, animal services actually let me have bats that weren't, um, didn't have any human or pet contact. Um, now that we have our clinic and our veterinarian, they're a little bit more relaxed about us taking bats as long as there hasn't been any contact. 
But anyway, I had him for 16 years. He, he um, which is a really long time. He was pretty awesome. This is one way that we feed bats when we have them in, in rehabilitation. These are Mexican free tail bats and they tend to be very squirmy and won't hold still when you try to feed them. So we get them to nurse off of a um, eyeshadow sponge and just keep putting drops of milk down and, and the pliers actually help secure them so they don't squirm all over and, and that, that way then we can go through and get them fed rather very quickly. So Mexican tree tails um, don't hibernate. Most of the bats in our area don't hibernate. And free tails come over here, actually migrate over here from the Central Valley because our winters are so um, mild. And when, when the bats do um, migrate or hibernate, they go back to their original um, habitat where they, where they live. The males are the ones that show up first and they start deciding where their territory is going to be in the caves and they'll mark it. They, they have some glands on the sides of their neck that they use to mark their territory. And they put a little urine in there too to make this wonderful aftershave that just drives the ladies crazy. And they have special songs that they sing to, the, to their pr prospective females. And the females fly around and decide who has the best aftershave and who has the nicest song. And then they, that's where they decide to stay. Pacific Wildlife Care ends up with some of the losers of these um, battles that some of the free tails get into over territory. And I, I had a, one bat in particular that I, I remember years and years ago that was very territorial. When it was um, in the spring, I could hardly put my, my hand into the cage to feed him without him coming and attacking me. And he, 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 was, um, he was really vicious course didn't do much damage to me but I'm just saying that they're they can to each other um these are hoary bats they're twins this is another bat that will have more than one pup these are foliage roosting bats they sleep in the trees they like evergreens they like um avocado trees different kinds of fruit trees and they're solitary so they you would never find them in big colonies if they were to be um, to somehow get into a cave, they would probably not be able to find their way out. They're used to being out in the open. Um, so I, while I was caring for hoary bats, my mentor was telling me how some bats really like avocado. And so I, I had the pallid bat at that time and I thought, well, I'll give some to him and, and just, um, see how it goes if he likes it so I fed it I gave him a piece in the in his little cage in his cage he dropped it and I thought it was an accident so I gave it to him again and he dropped it again the third time he flung it across the the cage um, I'm sure he was really trying to tell me that he wasn't interested in the avocado at all bats have different personalities within species they have their their we're really fortunate to be able to observe them um, when we care for them. We, we, as rehabilitators, we think that, that pallids tend to steal from each other because of the way they um, are very aggressive about taking mealworms from our tweezers, whereas other bats are a lot more gentle about it and um, might turn their head away. Um, pallids are uh, very aggressive when, they, when they're hungry and they realize that that's all you, they, that they, that you're doing is to feed them. These are red bats. They are also a, a foliage roosting bat that we have in North County. Well, we have them all over the Central Coast. Um, most of the pups that we get in come from North County. And these bats are a little bit different in that they can have up to five pups and she'll hang them in different spots in the tree, hoping that some of them survive. Bat pups, um, 40% of the pups that are born to bats during the spring don't make it through their first year, which is um, a lot lower than, than most wild animals. It's, it's a percentage of 60% for bats that, um, for other animals, I'm sorry, other animals. 
these bats have been known to roost in piles of leaves that people rake up. And so it's always a good idea to get rid of that pile right away if, if you're planning on burning it, especially. This is a Mexican free tail bat. Um, they're the ones that are in, that are very, very common across the US. What I will say about him. They have huge, huge numbers. They, their colonies are really, really big. Um, These are humanensis. They are very tiny bats. You will find them when you're out camping. They're the first ones that usually come out and get a drink of water. And then they go off to feed and they will, they will eat soft body insects, which include the, mos the mosquitoes that are flying around, around your head trying to eat you. California leaf nose bat. I think she takes that buddy disguise a little bit far. These bats are in the Sonora Desert and um, the Mojave Desert. They are ground hunting bats and eat a lot of crickets and things like that. This is a spotted bat, very beautiful bat that you can find up around Yosemite. You can see her back, but um, her chest is white with a black collar. They are one of the few bats that you can he actually hear their echolocation call. Um, this bat was in rehabilitation for, for quite a long time because of a wing injury, and she was eventually released. She has one of the biggest set of ears of, of the bats. This is a fishing bat. They live down in the um, South America and Amazon area. They're very small. They're, he, this bat's going after a minnow and you can see his echolocation call going out to hit and hitting the fin of the fish and then bouncing back to him. So he knows exactly where it is even though it's completely dark. This picture was taken by a friend in Costa Rica, but it could have e just as easily been taken in San Diego. We have three different kinds of bats that come up from Mexico that have their maternity roosts in um, Southern California and Arizona. They're nectar feeding bats, so that's why they're attacking the hummingbird feeder. So when bats eat, when fruit bats eat, when they're drinking the nectar, they, they plow into the flower, as you can see from this cutaway, and they get pollen all over their shoulders and all over their heads. And they go to the next, next flower and that's how they, they're pollinating, just like bees. There are, I think about 60 different plants that are, um, depend on bats to pollinate. Before the bat goes to bed, it goes to bed in the morning, goes to sleep, it will groom all of that pollen off of its body. Bats are very clean animals. They're constantly grooming themselves, just very much like our cats. And they're pretty smart. They learn how to eat out of a dish very quickly. This dish is loaded with mealworms and that's, this bat has learned to, that's where her dinner is. This was a non-releasable bat that I had years and years ago and um, she learned to eat on her own very quickly. Vampire bats don't live here. Vampire bats live in the rainforest where it's warm all the time. They, um, there are only three different kinds of vampire bats. Two of them drink bird blood. We found this out when we went down in the rainforest, brought them home and put them in zoos and fed them cow's blood and they died. So there's really only one kind of bat that drinks mammal blood. We don't have to worry about them at all here because they don't live here. It's much too cold. This is a pallid bat. 
that eat, they eat something a little bit different than insects. They eat um, centipedes, scorpions, potato bugs are their very favorite food. So if you have are finding um, pieces of potato bugs, like the heads and the legs around your buildings or um, around the floor, around uh, your patios, this bat has been using your, um, your house as a place to eat. Bats have a day roost where they sleep and then they have a night roost where they either eat or um, rest in between foraging. Bats have learned to take advantage of a lot of the buildings and, and things that we create. This is um, an expansion joint under the freeway where bats have, have decided would be a wonderful habitat for them to live. Silver-haired bats sometimes live on the outside of trees because they blend in so well with, with the... Um, with the bark. This is an English bat. He happens to be sticking his head out of a woodpecker hole, a nesting hole. You can believe that the woodpecker is not, does not have any babies there now because we all know that how mother birds are as far as intruders into their nest area. So this bat is just taking advantage of, of an empty nesting spot. This is habitat also as well for bats. Sometimes, um, nursery roost and sometimes um, a whole colony will live in the in the palm fronds. Bat houses, do they work? This one seems to be overloaded. This one, the bats are cleaning on the outside and completely covering the inside and the backside of the bat house. Bats have a pretty specific um, criteria when it comes to um, occupying a bat house. And if anyone's interested in in building one or wants to know how to put one up, I've got some, some handouts that I'd be more than happy to email to you if you just get a hold of me somehow. So rabies can be a problem. It's a virus and it is a very, um, fragile virus. It doesn't last long in the sun. It doesn't last long when it gets cold. Um, it, it needs to be, it, it's much more um, fragile than a lot of the other viruses that we're um, currently dealing with. Once a bat shows signs of rabies, there's no way to save it. And bats can be incubating rabies for, I think the longest one's been in, in captivity has been a little bit over 250 days. So just because they come in and we think they aren't um, rabid and they aren't showing signs, that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't um, coming down with it. So everyone that, that works with bats in, at the clinic has to have their pre-exposure rabies shots. US Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that we've lost 80% of our bats over the last 20 years from deliberate destruction to habitat loss and pesticide use. And there are now a couple of other reasons as well. We all know what um, wind turbines are doing to migrating birds and, and to migrating bats as well. You can see how huge they are. You can see the man standing down below the, down here and he's got his dog, his lab is standing there as well. They, uh, with bats, they don't make it all the way to the blades. They, um, the barometric pressure changes and it kills them before they even get close. We suspect that they're, they're seeing that as an old growth tree. And then there's a white nose syndrome, which is um, at this time, Researchers are finding that some bats are, have genes that are um, helping them to produce antibodies or to, to build up their immune system to um, resist the, 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 
fungus that's being um, growing on their body. When they do come down with this, they are aroused several times when they're trying to hibernate through the winter and that causes their fat supply to, to dwindle and they don't have enough to last them all the way to spring. So researchers are finding that some of them are passing the genes on to their offspring as well. And they're working on, um, on a vaccine for, for bats to, to stop this. We've lost millions of bats to the West, to the, not West Niles virus, to the white nose syndrome fungus. And then the coronavirus, um, as most of you may have already read and, and heard, is the one that is affecting humans is not from bats. Bats do carry over 200 um, different variants of, of coronavirus, but the one that is currently um, causing this pandemic um, is is not carried by bats at all. So we can't get the coronavirus from, from bats. We, as rehabilitators this, this year, um, Fish and Wildlife Service had us, I'm sorry, Fish and Game had us, um, I'm being distracted, I'm sorry. Could, could you guys be quiet in there, please, Ivy? Thanks. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service had us um, have the bats tested for, for coronavirus before we could release them this last year because they wanted to be sure that we were not giving the coronavirus to the bats. Um, fortunately, none of us were infected and we did not pass it on to the bats, but um, I just thought it was pretty interesting that 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 we were that that we, it, fish and wildlife is worried about us giving them giving the bats the disease. So in closing, I just want to share this U-Haul um, that I saw one day at the when I was getting gas. I was pretty impressed that um, that Missouri paid for advertising for bats. And the only way that we're going to save it, save bats, is through scientific research and public education. People to understand how truly important they really are. Okay, so I'm going to stop this. I'm going to show you a couple of really short videos now. I hope. So this is this is um, this is showing you the bats coming out of Racken Cave, which is like I said before, the biggest cave of bats in the world. If you can go there and um, Bat Conservation International owns the property and they have tours and and Ivy and I got to go watch this one summer many, many years ago and they co all come out and they are going in one direction as they're coming out. But we noticed that there were maybe a handful that are going the opposite way. We decided that those must have been the teenagers not following their mother's instructions. And then while we were there, we also saw several um, um, ah, what am I trying to say? Albino bats that were flying around, which we thought was pretty interesting. And we did not go over this before, but I want to share with you the bat that I have at home. That's my education bat. So I'm going to put it in front of the camera and hope you can see it. Oh, she's turning around. I think I have a reflection going on. So this is this is a um, big brown bat. And there's a lot of glare going on. She has a broken wing. She had a broken wing. I've had her for probably about 10 years now. And you can see that this wing, the one on the bottom, is um, in a funny position. It healed, but it healed in a um, frozen position. So she doesn't have full range of motion there, so she can't fly. So she's been coming and doing education programs with me for quite some time. She's starting to wake up. That's why she's shivering. 
I hope you all can see this. I forgot to run. Okay. I don't know if you can see your face. Anyway, I don't think I can hold her. I shouldn't, I'm not supposed to hold her with my bare hands. So. <clears throat> She's just peeking around the corner. I guess that's about it. If you had any questions or something else. Oh, thanks for telling me you could see her. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, anybody who has questions, if you want to type them into chat, we've got one question from Sharon B. Says, I've considered becoming a Central Coast bat counter. Is it best to consider habitat when determining species because it's so hard to determine species in low light or darkness? Ah, uh, that you'd have to talk to a bat biologist about. I really don't know. Um, I, I've, I've only been out on a few surveys at night myself and it's always been using mist nets. And um, so I, I, and I, I don't know very much about the computer programs that are available to, that pick up their echolocation calls and how they, determine what kind of bats they are there. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you there. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody's saying they have bats under their porch. They do, they do roost under things too, the, uh, low as well as, as up high. So that's not, that's not unusual. Is it a problem? Doesn't appear to be. <laughs> good. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, somebody's saying they can't wait to go to the Yolo Bypass. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really fun out there. We we we've gone. I mean, I've gone there before Corona, of course, but um, I'm pretty sure Corky's going to be doing it again this summer. Things seem to be opening up. So yes, go. I I encourage you to go. And to Austin, if you can go to Austin and see, there's you know there's a bridge in Austin that has has I think about a million bats that fly out at night. Yeah. So that's a place to go. And then from there you can just you can um, go to the cave. The the Bracken Cave is really close there, and you can um, get in through Bat Conservation International, make a reservation, and and go in and see that. Both of those places are great to go see. I can attest to the Austin Bridge. I've been there and seen the bats fly out at night. It's just, yeah. it's it's not like anything else I've seen in my life. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, and you mentioned that the spotted was the only bat where we could actually hear their echolocation. Why is that? It, the frequency is at a, a range that our ears can hear. Everything right. else is too high. Someone has bats using their block wall to hang on to to eat beetles they catch at night, and they're wondering how they can clean the wall where they where they lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that, that's a tough one. Um, I those are pallid bats, and they're eating um, cricket. I mean, they're eating the potato bugs. You get oh, potato yeah. bug parts, and. Um, I actually have one that's doing that above my door and my husband's not happy about it. They're really, I haven't found any product that really um, cleans it very well. It's, it's yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, once you get your bat box up, is there a way to attract them? They will find it. If it's in the right spot at the right height and then, and the right temperatures, they will find it. Bats are very curious when they're out flying around and they will find it, it might take a while. So if, if you don't have any action within a couple of years, then you should probably move it, but um, they will find it. There's no, I know that it's been advertised that you can smear some bat guano on the, in the bat house and it'll attract them, but that really doesn't work. They, they will find it. Are there directions about how to site uh, the bat house for, um the uh, for op optimum for, to, for it to be optimum for bats? I can send you some things and, and there's stuff probably on, on Bat Conservation International's website. I think they even have a bat house program where they're okay. monitoring bats. If you but, send that to me, to my email, um, okay. I will um, post it on our on YouTube when we put up your, vi your uh, video. Oh, and okay. we'll make it um, so everybody can get um, get to it. 
Okay, that sounds like a plan. Awesome. I will do that. Okay. Uh, looks like that's it for the questions. So everybody just says thank you. I mean, I've got so many thank yous. It was very fascinating. I, I, I have to tell you, I felt really rusty talking about them. And my I don't think that I was as, as I didn't flow as well as I had hoped because I, and here's my excuse. I haven't given a talk in over a year now. And I, I'm, I, I'm, I apologize for oh. being, having a lot of uhs and does and. It went really <laughs> well. So thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Is, is what, what, what is, is there that actually preys on bats? Cats, dogs, raccoons, snakes, um, owls, hawks. Not a lot, really, because of the way they roost. Um, a lot of the reason behind their roosting in the middle of a cave or on the sides of a cave or up really high is to be away from predators. And so once a predator realizes where they're coming out, then they will sit there and wait for them to come out. I can remember one year I got five or six bats from the same cat because he was just hanging out where they were coming out of there out for the night. But hawks will do that. And, um, and, and, but they, they don't take nearly the number of um, bats that people do. People are, are, are just the number one. Yeah. Oh, they are. They can decimate a whole colony in a matter of minutes. When a bat goes to sleep, he goes into torpor when he's sleeping at night. And so it takes them two or three minutes to warm up to be able to even move. And they start to shiver, but it takes a long time for them to fly. And in, in that amount of time, if someone, I've heard so many horror stories, if someone doesn't want them there, it's really easy to destroy the whole colony before they even wake up enough to be able to move. And we lose a lot of bats because of that. So. One other question, what do you feed your bat? <laughs> mealworms mealworms they've and they've learned to eat out of dishes and they're they're really really intelligent animals really smart well melinda once again thank you very much we appreciate it and it was a great talk you're welcome thank you thanks for having me okay all right good night everyone good night